I think we will get started. There may be one of two colleagues joining us, but I think it's time to begin. So all of you are most welcome to this uh, seminar uh, that we have entitled Mind the Gap, How Can Humanitarian and Development Aid Work Together? The Case of Syria. This is being organized by the Expert Group for Aid Studies, or Expert Group and for Based on Sanalyse. Um, and it's a collaborative uh, event that we organize together with our German colleagues, uh, the German Institute for Development Evaluation. And I'm particularly pleased that uh, the director of the institute, uh, Jörg Faust, is also here. Welcome. Um, and he will join us as a panelist and provide comments a little bit later uh, this morning. My name is Johan Schar. I'm a member of the Expert Group for AID Studies, uh, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know it, who, have not, uh, uh, who are not familiar with it, it's a government committee, uh, the, the expert group. Uh, we are appointed uh, by the government uh, as members of the expert group, and we are supported by the secretariat. Uh, our task, our terms of reference are to uh, work towards the improvement of Swedish development cooperation. Um, and we are uh, tasked to analyze and evaluate Swedish international development assistance. Uh, not only development assistance, we've uh, broadened our mandate, uh, not explicitly so instructed by the government, but we've felt it appropriate also to address uh, humanitarian issues. Uh, we try to address overarching issues within Swedish aid that would not be addressed by others and not look at individual projects that would normally be evaluated by CEDA and, and other actors. We like to talk about our double independence. Uh, we, are, we independently decide uh, on the issues to be studied and analyzed. Um, and, and studies that we commission, uh, the authors who produce these studies uh, are, are independently uh, uh, responsible uh, for what they produce. So the, the analysis, the recommendations and so on uh, from these studies belong to the authors. They are not the, the recommendations of the, of the committee. Um, we, our ambition is to bridge gaps between um, policy research and practice. And that is why these kinds of seminars, events, uh, uh, to enable people to discuss findings are so important to us, and a sort of key aspect of, of what we do. And of course, this is also the ambition today. Um, and I'd like to sort of present the purpose of this seminar as being twofold. Uh, first of all, we're going to discuss uh, and have a presentation on the, the nexus, the relationship between humanitarian and development action. Um, and and uh, the, the presenters will explain to us um, what is this nexus, why is it important, why is it that we have been debating and discussing this for decades now. We were discussing last night how many decades have we talked about this, but it's certainly a very long time. Um, and they are going to particularly study how this is being applied uh, or not applied in, in Syria at the moment. But somehow it doesn't feel quite the right use of language to talk about Syria as simply a case. Uh, uh, there's a recent uh, study from the International Crisis Group which talks about Syria and a few other countries as uh, places where we can observe misery as strategy, meaning the, the uh, horrendous suffering of the civilian population, the deliberate targeting of civilians, and the systematic and massive violations of international humanitarian law as, as an instrument in this uh, conflict. And we will try to, at least to some little extent, give justice to, to the situation in, in Syria during this uh, seminar. Um, we'll have a 30-minute presentation of the study uh, by two of its authors, Alexander Cox and Ruben Bedel, who will join us in a second. Um, we will then have a short Q&A, mostly for clarification, questions for clarification to the authors. 
Um, and we will then an, invite a panel of four discussants, and I will introduce them a, a little later, and then we will open for a general discussion. And we have until 11.15, so we need to be a little disciplined today. So please, Alexander and uh, Ruben, welcome. Thank you very much, Johan, for this kind introduction. Uh, we are delighted to be here in Stockholm to present uh, our literature review. Um, it underlines, I think, the uh, relevance of this topic uh, to see such high attendance. Um, this is not to be taken for granted with a topic that has been around for decades in various forms. And uh, so thank you very much for joining us here today. We have uh, structured our presentation in six parts. We will start with the background of the review then go on to the research question before we start explaining how we went about answering that research question in the methodology part, then go on to present the conceptual findings as well as the empirical findings before we close our presentation with the recommendations and uh, suggestions for the way forward. Um, we have seen in recent years a sharp rise in conflict-induced migration. As you can see to the graph to the right, uh, the numbers of refugees, IDPs, and asylum seekers have sharply risen from 42.5 million in 2011 to 65.6 in 2016. Um, parallel to this worrying trend, we also see that the numbers of newly displaced due to conflict and persecution has also sharply risen from 4.3 million in 2011 to um, 10.3 in 2016. Also, conflicts are increasingly um, protracted and often affecting neighboring states in fragile situation. 80% um, of the world's refugees are living in countries that are classified as low or middle income countries. Then there's also a political dimension to it. Um, it seems to be the political overall objective in Western countries, creating conditions for refugees enabling to stay where they are and not continue the journey to Western countries. Also. Um, there's an overall political objective of some Western countries to create conditions for refugees that enable um, um, the, uh, to manage the complexity of this development. And humanitarian and development actors are de facto often already working in the same context. So all this um, has contributed to the question how to link humanitarian assistance and development cooperation. Um, as one without the other is often not sufficient or even possible. Um, this topic was also prominently discussed then uh, on the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul in 2016, where the United Nations Secretary General um, urged humanitarian development actors to transcend their traditional silos and work together towards agreed collective outcomes over a multi-year time horizon. However, we find that the summit report itself remains vague on the question, how can responses to conflict-induced migration crisis be linked effectively? So before we go on, let's take a look at what actually shall be bridged. Um, this is an ideal type juxtaposition of international humanitarian assistance and international development cooperation. In terms of objectives, we see that humanitarian, um, the objectives are saving lives and alleviate human suffering. On the development cooperation side, the objectives seem to be broader and focus on uh, the evalu evaluation of uh, poverty, long-term social and economic development, good governance, and the rule of law. Um, also, the, um, the uh, way of working, the modus operandi varies. In the humanitarian side, we see that the modus operandi is short-term. In this case, short-term refers to the level of objectives. Uh, because even though humanitarian assistance is engaged continuously in protracted crisis, traditionally it uh, concentrates on short-term immediate objective, such as um, saving lives. Um, other characteristics are individual, intermediate, and unconditional. On the other side, international development cooperation 
is long-term, structural, selective, and conditional. There's also a difference in the principles. The humanitarian side adheres to humanitarian principles, humanity, independence, and uh, neutrality, while the development side adheres to principles such as the uh, principles for aid effectiveness, uh, national ownership, alignment with partner strategies, and the harmonization among donors. Um, the legal basis also differs. We see that uh, the humanitarian side has the uh, international humanitarian law, while the um, development side, this is basically agreements with partner countries binding under international law. Then on the actor side, we see that both sides have multilateral and bilateral actors as well as non-governmental actors with organization either working exclusively on one side or the other or with organizations that are already working on both sides. These are then dual mandated organizations. An example is uh, UNICEF, for example. Um, so this brings us to the main question on um, how can these two worlds that are just presented um, connected or like bridged effectively? And in order to answer this question in a literature review, we first looked at how conceptual literature on the linkage debate defines and operationalizes the gap between development cooperation and humanitarian assistance. Out of that, we formulated uh, a research question for conceptual lit literature on the linkage discourse. Um, what is needed to effectively link humanitarian assistance and development responses to forced migration? This is our uh, conceptual question that we posed. And the result of answering this question is uh, an analytical framework that we developed. And this framework enabled us to answer our second research question, which is our empirical question, to what extent and why or why not are effective linkages established in practice. And then on this empirical uh, question, we applied the analytical framework that we have developed uh, for evalu evaluative literature on the most recent and prominent forced migration crisis, which we thought is Syria. And the rationale for uh, selecting Syria is um, because we thought if there's evidence um, for linking, it will most likely be uh, found in most relevant case in terms of political pressure uh, funding levels and applied aid modalities. Um, then there's something, okay, all right. Um, so this brings us to the part where we talk about how we went about answering the uh, research questions. And here in the first step, um, we selected the most relevant concepts on the linkage debate. And uh, relevant means here that uh, those concepts were the most referred to in um, conceptual literature on the linkage debate. And these concepts that we selected are linking relief, rehabilitation and development, resilience, the whole of government approach, early recovery and connectedness. We then used a sampling uh, procedure that is close to that of a systematic review with clearly defined inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, on the conceptual literature. On the conceptual sample, then, we applied a content analysis that allows us to extract those parts of the literature that defines and operationalizes the gap. Uh, and this inductive and iterative process enabled us to get a better understanding on the gap and its dimensions, as well as the, uh, to collect recommendations on how to close, actually, this gap. Uh, the result of this process is that we defined seven dimensions or sub-gaps um, on the humanitarian gap itself and 19 recommendations on how to close this sub-gap. And this then resulted in the uh, analytical framework that I talked about earlier. To answer then the empirical question, we selected an empirical sample using selection criteria. For example, we only focused on literature in English uh, that discuss programs in countries uh, like Syria, Turkey, Iraq, Lebanon, and Jordan. Then we did a keyword search on the documents for terminology on the nexus debate uh, that is derived from our analytical framework. And uh, this provided us with a sample of 30 documents. Now, on this sample, on this empirical sample, we used uh, the analytical framework that we have developed through the conceptual literature. Uh, where we looked at evidence of unestablished linkages as well as conducive and hindering factors. 
Uh, so to sum it up, uh, this approach allowed us to analyze empirical evaluation reports through the linkage perspective and contributes to the understanding on how linkages can be established effectively. So let's have a look at the actual analytical framework that we talked about earlier. And for this, my colleague Alexander Cox will take over. Great. Many thanks, Ruben. So let's directly move uh, into the conceptual findings. Our conceptual findings uh, allow us to describe the abstract concept of the humanitarian development gap in a, a more structured and concrete manner along semantic subgaps that describe different dimensions of the main gap. So you can say the studies we have analyzed uh, understand or describe uh, the humanitarian development gap as a multidimensional uh, problem, or you could also say the humanitarian development gap is a sum of different uh, subgaps. The definitions of the subgaps and the corresponding recommendations are. Uh, um, we have put them into an analytical framework which uh, captures the state-of-the-art knowledge on the linkage discourse and allows us to analyze empirical studies, as Ruben said, on the linkage, uh, 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 on the international response to the crisis, uh, Syria crisis, through the lens of the linkage discourse. So, uh, due to time constraints, we subsequently introduce a short definition of each uh, subgap and only one core recommendation uh, on how to close the respective subgap. So let's start with the vision and strategy gap, which we identified from the literature as one of the main dimensions of the humanitarian development gap. And you can briefly uh, um, 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 define it as the absence of a common strategic framework that integrates and aligns humanitarian and development responses. And um, the corresponding core recommendation we have identified, among others, is that humanitarian and development actors should uh, develop joint country strategies. Why? Well, the rationale for, it, for this is that uh, such strategies integrate and align humanitarian and development efforts and ideally provide guidance on how to integrate, sequence and uh, complement programs from both realms. So the, the aim here is to ensure coherence in order to work towards agreed uh, common goals such as uh, resilience, for example. Another uh, subgap we have identified is the funding gap which uh, uh, is caused by insufficient, unbalanced and inflexible funding uh, for relief and longer term development responses. And here the core recommendation uh, is that funding mechanisms should be more flexible, enabling actors to react to unforeseen circumstances and allow for rapid responses to emergencies. Um, the background uh, for this recommendation is that funds uh, can often be used only for narrowly defined purposes or for uh, specific periods, which avoids taking a more flexible and uh, holistic approach uh, uh, in the crisis response. So instead, it is assumed that donors uh, can increase flexibility by relaxing earmarking funds or by adapting the uh, eligibility criteria. And then they also mention uh, several uh, innovative funding mechanisms such as uh, pool funding, for example, there's a UK's conflict pool fund. Um, and moreover, it's also said that longer term funding enhances uh, flexibility. The third uh, subgap or dimension of the main humanitarian development gap we have identified from the conceptual sample studies is the uh, planning gap which um, can be defined or is given if humanitarian assistance and development cooperation are planned independently and with insufficient consideration of one another. Here, one of our uh, recommendations or the recommendations um, um, extracted, so to say, from the conceptual literature is that uh, a joint planning process should be initiated, including a wi wide variety of relevant stakeholders to develop a coherent and need-based response to the uh, crisis. The rationale for this is that joint planning provides opportunities to harmonize uh, different perspectives and working procedures uh, uh, among humanitarian and development actors in order to create a holistic response approach as stipulated in the broader strategy, if there is one. <laughs> and uh, it is also said that uh, joint planning teams are more likely to under, under, uh, address misunderstandings and prejudices originated in different working cultures and beliefs, and uh, that joint planning also better ensures to target uh, the same groups. 
So the fourth and also important sub-gap we have identified uh, is the institutional gap uh, which exists uh, when the international coordination structure, the skill set of human resources and exter external cooperation strategies or institutions <coughs> are harming uh, effective linkages. And here one of several recommendations is that donor countries should strive for a high degree of interdepartmental cooperation in order to reduce redundancies and contradictions in uh, overseas operations. The background for this uh, recommendation is the observation that the lack of cooperation within institutions, including in and between ministries, is considered a major obstacle uh, for bridging uh, the two forms of assistance. And the conceptual studies argue that a single department or unit uh, for both forms of assistance is better positioned uh, uh, to generate linkages. And such units should also employ staff with mixed uh, skill sets, uh, experience in humanitarian and uh, development uh, assistance and cooperation. So let's now move to uh, three more gaps, um, which are located more on an implementation level. The, um, this is uh, the geographic gap which is uh, pr present if humanitarian and development programs or projects are not conducted in the same region and thus are not sufficiently uh, linked with each other. So here, one of the recommendations we have extracted from the uh, literature is that humanitarian and assistance and development cooperation should be conducted in geographical proximity in order to reach uh, the same target groups uh, uh, when, the ex uh, when the context permits. Of course, this is not uh, always possible. The background here is the observation uh, that humanitarian and development programs are frequently carried out uh, in, in different geographical areas while targeting different uh, groups with various uh, approaches. So let's now move to the last two subgaps we have identified, which are also important to understand the main humanitarian devel development gap. The sixth one is the uh, ownership, which uh, occurs when uh, um, national and local actors are not sufficiently involved in international humanitarian responses. And the corresponding recommendation is um, that international humanitarian assistance should seek uh, to development capacities of national and local stakeholders. The rationale uh, uh, for this is that capacity development enables national and local actors in host countries to deal with current and current and future crisis, and this that this is an investment a means, so to say, to achieve longer term impact uh, within a host country. So here, this is important to realize, it is not about fostering linkages uh, between humanitarian and development actors, but between humanitarian and states, civil so society and private actors within the host countries. So the final uh, sub-gap we uh, have identified is the sequence gap, which exists when relief, rehabilitation and development uh, activities are combined in an, uh, uh, not combined in an appropriate Time frame. And our core recommendation uh, is like a program design should ensure an adequate sequencing, including timing of humanitarian and development phases. Why? Well, here the rational is uh, straightforward. When phases and transitions are adequately designed, aid interventions remain free from delays or negative past dependencies that put target groups at a disadvantage. For example, as you all know, uh, too, long, too long humanitarian aid leads to a lack of autonomy and uh, self-reliance on the side of, of the end beneficiaries, the target groups. So moreover, Adequate sequencing facilitates handovers and uh, exit actions and uh, also creates continuity. And it is necessary to create a transition in both directions from relief to development and from development to relief if we uh, 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 remind that the contigo, of the contiguum approach in con uh, protracted crisis. No? The situation is always changing. Sometimes humanitarian aid is needed, then development, and again humanitarian aid. Yeah, that was the first impression on the conceptual findings. And now I would like to invite you to jump with us into uh, 
the empirical findings, at least uh, to highlight some uh, of them. So as Ruben already said, we have confronted the analytical framework with uh, studies on the international response to the Syria crisis uh, and asked whether there are effective linkages, whether there's evidence uh, for linkages as to these uh, different uh, subgaps. So overall, we can say, and that's the good news, that progress has been made in linking humanitarian assistance and development corporations, mostly in countries bordering to Syria, compared to the early years of the crisis, which was mainly uh, humanitarian driven. Um, and this basic findings holds especially true for the strategy and the plan planning gap, while we found uh, mixed evidence for the other gaps. And we can now have a look on the different subgaps. So, as I said, uh, progress has been made as to the uh, vision and strategy gap. For example, there are now uh, joint international strategies in place, such as uh, uh, um, refugee and resilience plans, the three IPs, which align, which align the humanitarian and uh, development response. And moreover, donors are increasingly uh, committed to longer term engagement. And we can also see from the literature at least a shift towards uh, a resilience agenda. However, on the negative side, it is to say that the resilience component of the three IPs does not focus on refugees to the same extent as on host communities. And um, it must also be said that unified donor country strategies on the donor country level are the exception uh, rather than the rule. And with regard to the planning gap, um, there is evidence of joint planning among humanitarian and development actors at both levels, on donor, at a donor country level and host country level. For, with regard to the latter, there are a lot of uh, joint sector working groups, um, which uh, is to be judged positive. But on the negative side, we also see that local actors are only partially involved in the uh, planning process. Let's uh, also have a brief look at the funding gap. So on the positive side, with regard to achievements in linkage, uh, we can see that innovative uh, funding modalities are in place that allow for joint humanitarian development financing and that there are also flexible funding modalities to react, to quickly, to react quickly to unforeseen uh, circumstances. However, at the same time, and this is a remaining challenge, the, the shift towards the resilience agenda, which is stipulated in the strategies, is not reflected in actual allocation patterns. So there's still a strong emphasis on emergency assistance, which of course also needs more money, but which has more money, or there's more funding for humanitarian aid compared to a development cooperation at the expense, especially of uh, resilience uh, programs. So uh, let's move to the institutional gap. Um, there, on the positive side, uh, there are some development agencies, for example, CEDA, who link both forms of uh, assistance internally, also in order to, in, or in response to, uh, to the Syria crisis. But there are still a lot of remaining challenges in other institutions. For example, there's evidence of international organizations separating emergency, their emergency response uh, from, uh, develop, from their development response. And staff with mixed skills are still the exception rather than the rule. And moreover, in, in such crises as the Syria crisis, there is a high staff turnover, which often uh, inhibits improved humanitarian uh, development links. As to the ownership uh, gap, we can see that many international actors are working with national and local stakeholders in building their capacities. Nevertheless, capacity building, this is criticized in the empirical uh, sample studies, is often a top-down process with little influence uh, of, uh, for local actors. As to the uh, sequence gap, um, one of the findings is that many implementers are aware of the need uh, to adequately plan transition and sequence this is in program designs, but nevertheless, it is still difficult for them to find an appropriate timing of intervention, so this uh, remains uh, a challenge. And finally, um, with regard to the geographic gap, we have uh, found no evidence in the sample, so either the 
samples, the studies are not dealing with this topic, but um, so we found some indirect hints to the geographic gap. For example, um, um, development actors have not equally uh, a good access to IDPs and host communities within the Syrian territory as humanitarian actors have. And uh, with regard to all countries in the region, uh, region the spatial mobility of refugees makes it uh, quite difficult to reach them with both forms of assistance. So this was just to highlight uh, some of our findings. You can find much more empirical findings uh, with regard to the Syria crisis in our review. So now I move to the last uh, two slides. Um, let me um, point to some or two overall uh, findings of the review. And I would say it is important that our re uh, review reveals a systematic disconnect between conceptual claims and uh, evaluative findings. So on the one hand, the conceptual studies rarely base their considerations on more than anecdotal evidence. And on the other side, none of the empirical studies directly refer to any concept in the linkage debate. And this, of, of course, uh, bears the risk of premature uh, conclusions. For example, from a conceptual perspective, one could easily argue that the ownership gap, for example, is bridged when all stakeholders pay attention to a host country's interest in a migration crisis. However, as uh, the Syria crisis uh, reveals, host governments are pushing the resilience agenda heavily towards uh, benefits uh, for their own citizens, but not for, the, for refugees. So here you see a disconnect between empirical findings and conceptual claims. And um, a second finding, which is also very important to highlight, is that the literature, uh, both the conceptual and especially also the empirical literature, is largely silent on outcomes related to shifts in linkages. So all review studies leave open the question of who benefits from what kind of linkage. What are the positive or negative uh, consequences of linking efforts? I mean, this is the most important question. We can say we have to link, but if you don't know what the effects are, it, it doesn't make sense to claim this. So, for example, none of the studies examine systematically whether, for example, joint strategies that align um, the humanitarian development response to the Syria crisis actually contribute to reducing the vulnerability of refugees. And that brings me to um, at least two of our core recommendations towards a more profound debate uh, on the linkage uh, issue. So. First of all, it is important to develop and test a theory of the linkage. A consistent, a consistent log logic, a theory of change uh, of the linkage should be developed that explains exactly how to link to what on different levels in order to achieve what outcomes. And for this, our analytical uh, framework provides an input, a basis, and in order to validate such a theory of the linkage, um, impact assessments are necessary which uh, focus on outcomes. And then testing such a theory is also a prerequisite for giving, for example, a priority to uh, indivi uh, certain individual subgaps and uh, uh, for closing them. And of course, um, these uh, theory-based and impact-oriented evaluations need to look um, a different conflict context before more general statements can be put forward on the linkage. So we had a look at the Syria crisis, but in order to enhance external validity, it is also important to compare the situation with other crisis uh, contexts as to the linkage. And our second main um, recommendation is to stimulate a broader discussion on the nexus issue among evaluators, practitioners, and policy makers. I mean, that's why we are here. We are already starting with this today because the current debate on the linkage is very fragmented and also partially inconsistent. So what we need is a unified debate 
with a conceptual consistency based on empirical evidence instead of just using uh, empty political rhetoric, using buzzwords such, for example, common goals. I mean, what, what are common goals? Are common goals a subset of different humanitarian and development goals, for example, or are these the sole final goals uh, of both forms uh, of assistance? And moreover, it is also very uh, important to better understand the political economy underlying the humanitarian development gap, as the studies, at least these studies we have analyzed, are quite silent on this uh, important issue. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex, and yes, if you could remain just a few minutes and we'll open the floor for any uh, questions for clarification mainly. We're not really opening a debate quite yet, but anyone who would like to ask a question for clarification. Yes. Please, and please tell us who you are. Okay. The approach is well structured, but I noticed uh, uh, a new gap in this. It's the absence of uh, a very important uh, component of this uh, process. It's the cultural heritage process. We know that the Syrian people are well connected to their heritage, and uh, possibly they are uh, proud uh, about the, their heritage. And we know the, the role of the heritage in uh, the reconciliation process in uh, uh, healing the the, uh, the social trauma after after the, the crisis uh, in uh, peacemaking and uh, peace keeping uh, in targeting also uh, uh, the humanitarian crisis for example the alleviate the poverty so uh, is it possible to to involve uh, heritage studies in, to, to develop this research. Thank you. Yeah, many, many thanks for this important uh, comment. I mean, we have uh, analyzed the literature and then extracted the information and brought it together to these uh, seven subgaps, which are ideally subgaps. And of course, you can also think about introducing other uh, important uh, subgaps. In our understanding, these important uh, cultural aspects. Uh, we have understood them or taken them as hindering or conducive factor, for example, with regard to the institutional gap or the ownership gap. But you can also uh, do it in a different way. So many thanks again. And this could be an idea for further studies related to the Syria crisis indeed. Other questions? Or you, you can maybe say yes, please. Um, I would we are being recorded, so this is for posterity. Oh, okay. um, it's, it will be actually it, an exhibit in the museum after. Oh, we okay. Are, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would, uh, being at the policy side of things, could you please develop what you mean with that the current debate is fragmented? That in what way is it fragmented? Geographically, in different multilateral forums? Um, yeah, just clarify that a bit. Thank you. Well. As we already a couple of times mentioned, this is a very old debate uh, that has been around in various, on various levels for, for decades now, um, on policy level, on implementing level. And uh, as you've seen that we have analyzed five different concepts, this also speaks of a fragmentation of the whole discourse on various levels. So I think this is what we mean as fragmented. 
Yeah, I would agree to this. I mean, some of the concepts have been pushed forward by certain uh, certain institutions and organizations, so there's also a political agenda sometimes behind these uh, concepts, and th this is just what we mean. So people are referring to different ideas uh, put forward by different concepts, and our aim here was to bring it together into one analytical framework, but still um, there are open questions uh, as to how precise the recommendations are, um, no, so there's still much more work on it. I, I think that one of our panelists will will address the, the, the nature of the debate. Uh, you know, so if we wait a little, we'll hear more about this. Other questions? No. So then, thank you very much, Alex and thank Ruben, you. and um, you can yeah, sit down and relax. Um, and I would like now to invite uh, four panelists. Let me first uh, uh, introduce them to you briefly. <clears throat> so the first panelist is, is James Darcy, who is, in, is a British national, uh, an independent uh, consultant in, in the humanitarian sphere, uh, one of our most experienced uh, uh, colleagues in that area. And he has had a key role and is actually a, a, a major, or his work is a major source also for this report in that he led the, the Syria Coordinated Accountability and Lessons Learning Evaluation in 2016, which is a very comprehensive uh, review. Um, he's also a former head of the Humanitarian Policy Group at, uh, at ODI in London. Our second panelist is uh, Khulud Mansour, who is an independent consultant and researcher, a Syrian national uh, who lives in Sweden, um, who has an affiliation with uh, Chatham House in London and also with the Center for Middle East Studies in Lund, at Lund University. Um, and I'll, why don't you start to make your way up here to the first table, uh, James and, and uh, Hulud, uh, while I introduce uh, Joran Holmqvist, who is the director for the Department of Asia, Middle East, and Humanitarian Assistance at SIDA. Please. So if you take, yeah, so James and Hulud at one table, and Joran, and then uh, Jörg Faust, uh, Dr. Jörg Faust, who is the director of DIVAL, the, um, uh, the German Institute, which is our co-organizer uh, for this event. So welcome. So we've asked the four of you to give your comments. You represent um, four very different perspectives that we thought would be uh, enlightening for the, for the debate. Uh, and I'd like to ask James to start. Um, again, given the unique role that you have and have had both in terms of the Syria situation, uh, the way that agencies operate in Syria, but also uh, you have followed and been involved in this, this discourse, the, the humanitarian development discourse for many years. And I'd like you to comment uh, specifically on how do you see the evolution of this debate? What is it that has happened? And what, are the, what is the political dimension? Why is it so difficult to make uh, progress as we have seen today? Thank you, uh, Johan and, and, and Per also for, for inviting me uh, here. Um, and congratulations to the authors, by the way, who've done us a great service, I think, in pulling together a lot of quite disparate material. Um, I've worked for uh, much of the last 25 years um, at this interface, this intersection between the humanitarian and development agendas, partly as a practitioner with Oxfam as a program coordinator for many years, uh, partly on the policy side with ODI. Um, and more recently working with UN agencies, UNICEF in particular, on how to make sense of these, these agendas as a whole. Um, in the last five years, I've spent quite a lot of time on Syria and, and again, mainly with uh, the UN. Um, but I'd also like to, to broaden the discussion a little bit and introduce one or two uh, examples from places like Yemen, from South Sudan, from what. Um, because I think we also need to test out some of these 
propositions against a slightly wider uh, frame of reference. Um, look, I'd like to say, to talk briefly about three things. Uh, one is the conceptual aspects of this. Um, uh, the second is about the evolving landscape of humanitarian and development uh, work. And the third is more specifically about some of the political factors that are, uh, that are shaping that landscape. So on the conceptual side, um, I think if we confine ourselves to talking about how the different parts of the aid machinery work together, um, we're doing something very important, but it's a second order set of questions. Um, I spend a lot of my time on those questions. I do think they're terribly important. Um, but they're second order. I think there's a set of first order questions that we have to answer before we can properly answer the second order questions about approaches and machinery and so on. The first order questions, I think, are to do with, at the most fundamental, how crisis-affected people are able both to meet their immediate needs and to build a, a more stable uh, 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 future for themselves. And what are the factors that bear on that? Aid is just one of those factors. And we shouldn't forget that. It's often not the most important factor. There's a whole set of political, economic, social, cultural factors um, that have a, have a bearing on this. In other words, I suppose what I'm saying is there's a set of contextual questions that we have to address before we can properly answer some of the questions posed by this study. Um, that doesn't mean it's not useful to have an overall framework. I think it really is very useful. But we, shouldn't, we should be wary of looking for a sort of grand unifying theory here. Um, I'll come back in particular to the political question. Um, just on concepts, still on concepts, a couple of things that I think we could usefully add to the concepts on the table. One is risk and risk management. It's one of those bridging concepts between the humanitarian and development agendas. I used to spend a lot of time with my colleagues at ODI on this. Um, and it's, it's sort of in the interface um, between the two agendas. Things like livelihood diversification, things like microcredit. Uh, these are all uh, uh, approaches that are of common interest, I think, across, across the sector. So risk, risk management, approaches to risk management. The second concept I'd say it's worth spending a bit more time on is rights and rights protection. As a, as a mode of engagement or a mode of analysis. Um, we shouldn't forget that the humanitarian agenda is about protection as well as an as assistance, and particularly in the refugee uh, domain. The protection of rights is as much the, the priority as any other uh, issue for humanitarian and development actors. There's common ground here um, that we need to, to explore a bit more. One last thing on, on concepts. And, and the discourse. I think the, the author is absolutely right to say that the, the discourse is rather fragmented about the linkages. Um, but we shouldn't also confine ourselves to the, the literature on uh, the nexus. There is a lot of stuff that is re relevant to this subject that is not labelled any of those things. So, for example, the literature on forced migration and refugee studies has an awful lot to say about these issues. It just doesn't come labelled in, in those ways. So I think as, we, as this agenda is developed, as I hope it will be, um, there's, there's quite a lot to draw on in those aspects of the academic um, uh, domain. OK, that's, that's the, the, a few comments about concept. On the landscape, the evolving landscape, um, to some extent, there's been a convergence of interests and concern here, I think. I mean, in the post-MDG world, the Millennium Development Goals, there has been a consolidation of development concern around fragile states, around the more intractable poverty problems, if you like, the bits that the, the MDGs didn't really get at. There was very little progress on some of the most fundamental uh, goals uh, in fragile states. So there's a focus, at least among many development actors on that aspect of the development agenda. Um, um, and simultaneously, with, on the humanitarian side, increasing, as the authors have pointed out, increasing focus on protracted crises. I think 80 to 90 percent of humanitarian spend now goes on protracted crises, most of which involve significant uh, human displacement, forced displacement, internal and external. 
there are common agendas of concern here. Social protection is one, and, and, and it's in the domain of social protection and the role, or rather inadequate role, that the humanitarian system plays in social protection that, again, we find one of the areas of common discourse where there's quite a lot of useful work, I think, being done at the moment. Um, we have to recognize that in development terms, these are extremely challenging contexts. There's weak governance, absent governance, contested governance. Uh, all the things you, that the aid effectiveness principles kind of assume tend not to be there. And so we've got a real problem. And so this, there's an urgency about getting our act together between the humanitarian development system, because neither, neither has a good ready-made set of answers to these, to these questions. These are new challenges in many ways. One of them, by the way, is um, working in urban settings. There's an increasing tendency, and this relates to migration. A lot of the migration uh, issues relate to people displaced into urban centers. Um, so that, I mean, that's one amongst many issues. And often these are you know, people who may be farmers who will find themselves in an urban economy. How on earth do they survive? These are development challenges as much as humanitarian ones. Um, by the way, in some of the, the, the most difficult contexts here, South Sudan, Iraq, Syria, we're, we're talking about countries that are basically reforming themselves. This, the, the, we're, we're so far from having a stable development base here that these, the, the tectonic plates are shifting. Uh, and, uh, and there's, alongside that, quite a, a fair degree of balkanization, of separation of populations, often on ethnic lines, often politically manipulated. Um, and so the final point on this point about the landscape I would make is that resilience work is not necessarily a step on the path to development. We don't know what the context for development is going to be. Resilience is an agenda in its own right, enabling people to, to face their immediate future and the uncertainties that go with that. Uh, my last point, I will stop, is about the politics. Um, <clears throat> Politics are often the, the primary determinant of, of, of humanitarian outcomes. Uh, they're part of this sort of first order set of questions I talked about. And you only have to think about Yemen at the moment and the, 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 the attack on, on Hodeida port, which is critical to humanitarian supplies, to realize that that is, that is true. It affects the way the potential for delivering aid. There's a whole set of domestic constraints about uh, corruption, anti-terrorism, and so on, about the, the basic accountability platform for delivering aid. These are real challenges for development in particular, but also for humanitarian assistance. And in relation to the refugee agenda, and this is my last point, there's a huge set of political factors here. There are massive domestic political pressures on hosting countries including Turkey, by the way. This is a big domestic political issue, hosting this number of refugees. The political space is very, very tight here. Again, it's a, it's a common agenda across development and humanitarian. Refugees are being used as a bargaining chip. They are in Kenya. The Kenyan government keeps threatening to close Dadaab, the biggest refugee camp in the world, arguably to try and leverage more aid money, if you are cynical about these things. Um, so my point is this, that... that, that we need to, to think about those first order pressures and questions in order to sensibly come up with uh, better ways of thinking about this linkages of the mechanisms. That's it. Thank you very much, James. Um, I think very useful to remind us that, us that there are more sort of potentially bridging very important concepts such as risk and, and rights uh, that are not quite part of, of the conceptual literature perhaps. And also um, the fact that all the studies on forced migration probably contain a lot of substance that are extremely relevant for this debate. And of course reminding us that we are not talking about context that the aid effectiveness architects had in mind. This is something quite different. So thank you. Now, uh, Hulud has done quite a bit of research and studies on one particular aspect of of the gap de debated today, namely the interaction between the international agencies and, and Syrian uh, population and Syrian organizations. So um, from your perspective, uh, Hulud, what are your comments to what we've heard today? Okay. 
Uh, thank you very much uh, for, the, uh, for the invitation. I actually feel privileged to be here and to be the only Syrian and the only woman uh, among the panelists and discussants. So uh, a space that we always struggle as Syrians actually to, to find in the international and policy uh, arena. I'll just give some comments and concrete examples from the Syria case and I will divide them into uh, four categories. Uh, funding, uh, localization, coordination, and evaluation. Uh, with the funding, actually, and talking about this nexus between the humanitarian and development uh, uh, sectors, we need to actually uh, uh, examine the power structure in place. And I'll give example, uh, in, in, in Syria, the total known humanitarian funding in 2014 uh, to Syria was 2.1 billion uh, US dollar. 70% of this money, 70% uh, came from uh, five large donors and 50% of this money went to five UN agencies. So we need, uh, when we tackle this, we need to see the, the, the power structure in place regarding funding and donor governments. Um, the other thing also about funding is we, we always hear that the funding is fragmented, is insufficient, etc. But how I see it actually is not that. Uh, how I see is how the fund is being spent, how it is coordinated, and how much eventually is reaching uh, the Syrian uh, or the affected, uh, the affected people. And I'll give one example from Afghanistan uh, that 40% of the foreign aid uh, to Afghanistan went back to uh, donor countries. And some resources say that up to 60 or maybe 90% went back to donor countries in salaries, consultancies, and services. Uh, so, so, so this is also to, to, to tackle when we talk about the insufficiency of, of the funding, because I think it's not, it is sufficient, but it's how uh, to spend it. Um, uh, another point is the competition. The, 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 the competition over resources, because in the Syria case, it was mainly about winning big contracts because there, there's a huge amount of money, um, international organizations, UN agencies, everyone wanted to have big contracts. So, so this also um, uh, part of the actually um, a challenges to this nexus between the humanitarian and development, especially that we know um, uh, among each sector, like in the humanitarian itself, the uh, sector itself, there is a competition between the UNHCR and OCHA over the leadership and coordination and in the development between the UNDP and um, uh, the World Bank. Um, another point I want to mention, which is actually often ignored uh, when talking about aid, is the remittances. Because from my point of view, I just feel that aid is somehow overrated um, because no one is talking about remittances inside Syria and how much Syrian people actually is sending in, um, money to uh, support their families, relatives and friends. And in the study we did on the humanitarian uh, funding flow, um, uh, we, we, we found out that remittances in 2010, because there is no data after that to Syria, in 2010, then the remittances were equal to the aid uh, provided by the 29 DAC countries uh, in 2013 and 2014. So uh, unfortunately there is no data, but there are some um, studies that would uh, confirm that up to 70% of the Syrian population is actually depending on the money received from, from, their, own, uh, from their own people. Uh, the other point is the, uh, the other category I want to, to tackle actually is the localization and I would um, here would like to say um, Syrian actors because sometimes local and national actors might be perceived as the, um, the ones in the neighboring countries but I will emphasize on, on the Syrian actors. Also in the study I co-authored we found out in 2014 75, 70 5% of the humanitarian work implemented inside Syria was done by Syrian themselves. How much they received from the direct cash funding? 0.3% of, of everything. So, so this also give us this, you know, like the imbalance and the, uh, yeah, injustice somehow in distributing uh, uh, the fund. Um, 
And also when, when dealing with Syrian actors, we often hear that we cannot, we cannot cooperate or we cannot deal with the Syrian actors because they are impartial, they are not impartial, they are not neutral, they might be politically affiliated. And this is also for me just to reflect the double standards in the international humanitarian and development system where actually the whole aid is politicized and driven by a political interest uh, of the different organizations, different donor countries, and uh, uh, yeah, um, different actors in Syria. Um, there is also uh, something, I mean, that might reflect the hindrances or the challenges towards this nexus, uh, and I find it is the inconsistency in how to deal with the Syrian actors. And for example, and uh, I'll just give very, very uh, quickly, um, how much the Syrian actors are included in the humanitarian coordination meetings in the neighboring countries. In Turkey, for example, they were fully engaged, not now maybe, but just a year before. They were fully engaged, they were very um, uh, empowered, they were very influential. In Lebanon, they were totally excluded. There was zero in the humanitarian coordination meeting. In Jordan, only on only last year, in January 2007, where OCHA actually held the first meeting with the Syrian organizations after six years. So this inconsistency also, also affect the Syrian actors and affect, uh, because, because if you want to have this nexus efficiently and effectively, then you definitely need to include the Syrian actors from the early stages, from the planning, implementation, strategy, policy, and decision-making levels, not only at the implementation levels, but at every single level. Uh, when it comes to coordination, again, I just see um, see this nexus like like the humanitarian actors have first to to actually coordinate among themselves and the development actors to also um, um, coordinate among themselves. And one of the things that actually affected the Syria crisis, the information sharing. It was like everyone, as part of the knowledge is power, and especially in the first five, six years of the Syrian uh, conflict, everyone wanted to have the information. There was no sharing of information. For many reasons, many excuses, sensitivity of information, uh, uh, the security reasons, but this actually hindered uh, any kind of joint planning, joint as needs assessments, and led to duplication and overlapping and a lot of uh, problems uh, dealing with the Syrian humanitarian crisis. So um, uh, another point also is donors usually choose the UN as a default coordination mechanisms for the money. And even when they are, when the donor countries are not pleased with the performance of um, of the UN agencies, they cannot uh, hold them accountable and they cannot do anything because it's much easier to go uh, to the UN because this is like the norm, so it's much easier. Uh, but I think also donor countries need, need to shift uh, um, and need to be uh, somehow innovative in how to deal with the crises um, uh, globally. And I remember I was in, in Lebanon in 2015 writing or doing the field work for Chatham House report on the UN coordination and I met with one with one of the uh, coordination team that was actually commissioned by three donor countries and I was asking her um, they were doing an evaluation about the coordination which was exactly what what I was doing and then, and then she said like yeah we conducted 150 interviews and my simple question was how many in Syrian um, uh, individuals or organizations you have like and she said none like zero and for me like it's everything is always taken from the donor perspective the INGO's perspective I'm gonna finish just one, one point the evaluation um, um, and also I think how, how to do the evaluation. In the Syria case, especially in 2016 and 2017, we saw some evaluation reports that were very critical, including yours, that I, uh, James, that I uh, very much used in my uh, uh, research, and they were very, very critical. But unfortunately, on the other hand, we hear that donor countries, UN agencies, and INGOs would actually hire consultants or evaluators that, you know, they would act just do the evaluation the way they wanted them to be. So also how to evaluate the evaluations 
uh, this is a, a, this is a critical point, and the evaluation for me has to be uh, a, a program by program, uh, project by project, activity by activity, and just to see how much is actually receiving the the people um, uh, the people in need at the end. And I will finish here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Khulud. I think th this is a very stark and dramatic illustration to the sometimes uh, a bit uh, sort of abstract analysis that we uh, that we have been discussing. <laughs> what does, what do these gaps really look like on on the ground? And and I mean, you're talking about institutional gaps. You're talking about ownership gaps. You're talking about planning gaps. So in almost every respect, uh, there's a dramatic disconnect and and, and sort of. Uh, uh, an absence of relationship between international actors and those who are uh, particularly work uh, on the ground in Syria. Uh, I would encourage you to, uh, those of you who are interested, to approach uh, Hulud afterwards, and, and because you have written quite interesting and recent uh, uh, papers on these very topics. So please approach uh, Hulud afterwards. Thank you. So, Joran, <coughs> I turn to you. Uh, I think you, you have a, a, a unique uh, role today because you, as an individual, sort of embody the nexus. Because you are the head of a department at CEDA where you have both the humanitarian unit, um, you have regional units working in relatively stable countries, but you also have the Sy Syria unit, uh, which works according to a strategy which tries to address these this gap uh, quite concretely. So w what is the experience from CEDA and from you, for you personally in, in doing yeah. this? Can, right. can I also mention that <clears throat> Joran has done uh, research on social protection as part of aid, which obviously, as James uh, pointed out, is a, a very sort of potentially very important uh, uh, yeah. kind of activity. It's not the topic of today, but probably one of the most important bridges yeah, uh, exactly. yeah. that exists. Um, and I represent a department within CEDA which deals with all our long-term development aid to Asia, to Middle East, and also all our global humanitarian support. And I took up that, this job a year ago and asked myself who came up with this organizational chart. Uh, <laughs> and uh, some of it explained by history, but also, I think, on purpose uh, to create a friction point uh, between the humanitarian aid and the long-term support. So we live with that. Um, uh, thanks for the report. Uh, I was very impressed by the systematic identification and reading of the literature. And we have a Swedish word for that kind of work, which is Tysk Grundlighet, German thoroughness. And you should take that as a, as a compliment. Um, I have comments uh, briefly then to say something on the conceptual discussion, something on what CEDA is doing and not doing, and finally on Syria. So starting on the concepts, um, I was struggling a bit with um, with uh, the identi identification of all these different concepts that to me are, to some extent, they are words on overlapping concepts maybe. And as we've heard today, within CEDA we tend to say cluster. So we are not forced to use abbreviations nor 100 different definitions of resilience. So cluster is kind of the, the word we're using. Uh, and if you are to point out the common denominator, of all of it, and I think you do in the report, uh, that's coherence, uh, policy coherence. Uh, that's a big debate within the aid, not only in humanitarian and development. It's, it's been going on. And beyond aid, I would say that co coherence in government structures and so on between different policy areas, it's a huge field of uh, study. It's not really big, picked up uh, in a way, and, and one could have, and it has led me to think slightly differently on the approach um, and, and citing some, some something from the literature or from, from the history. I would start with Axel Luxenstierna, who was the, he's the hero of the Swedish public servant because in the uh, 17th century, he, he laid the foundation for our government structure, our silos. He was the silo guy, really, you know, you do this, you do that, you don't mess up with each other. But he also added one thing, and he's supposed to be very uh, thoughtful on that. He said, when, you should also reach out the hand to each other. Skola räcka ut handen till varandra. And, and, and uh, that has been interpreted as, you know, when the king had overriding concerns, you should all work together. So then you have to skip the silos for a while. My point here is that he clearly recognized, I think, 
that we face a balancing act when we deal with coherence. It's not a maximization problem, you know, as much coherence, as much gaps to be closed as possible. It's kind of weighing pros and cons and finding the right balance. Uh, another guy on the same track is, is uh, Nicolas, uh, Nicolas Steinbergen, uh, Nobel Prize laureate, uh, kind of old, but he coined you know, the expression that each economic policy objective should be addressed by applying the most adequate instrument under normal circumstances. Uh, so don't uh, address family policies with your value-added tax. That's an efficient, inefficient instrument. Keep the objective separate, keep the instrument separate. But of course, he also recognized that occasionally you have to work together. And the point is, again then, coherence or closing these gaps, it's not a maximization problem. It's an optimum we're looking for. We have to recognize both the pros and cons. And, and Sometimes I think that maybe if you look for a kind of more theoretical starting point, I would start somewhere there. And, and, and I fully support your recommendation that we need to know more about the impact of efforts to establish linkages, because that is the clue to understand this, this balancing uh, issue that we are facing. Uh, on CEDA, um, the report is very nice to see that. I don't know if you noted. I obviously underlined everywhere where it said see that. So then, and normally it was something nice that was said, uh, some recognitions of things that have been done. Uh, I would say one thing that is not written out that I would say is very important and that has been very positive. That is not CEDA, but it's our government. Because what has happened is that all, on all these country strategies, uh, that's kind of the, the guiding instruction to CEDA that we receive from the government. In all the strategies where we work now, in areas where there's a lot of humanitarian interventions alongside our development interventions, uh, and there's a huge overlap now. I think the only country where we have uh, a big humanitarian intervention without long-term development is Yemen. Uh, all the rest of the countries are long-term partners as well, actually. Uh, or, or, or context, at least. Um, so, um, uh, so the government, in a way, has helped us by giving mandates in these instructions. You know, you guys who do long-term development, you have to move into the nexus. Worded differently, but in all these strategies, almost now, and if not, uh, they will be when they are <laughs> renewed. Uh, we have that mandate, so it's no longer an issue of kind of working outside the box, doing things that we're not supposed to do, but still understand. It's really, uh, we're supposed to do this. Uh, and that has made a difference. Uh, I think also it's true, as you mentioned, that we increasingly share planning and strategy processes within CEDA, uh, that we have been able to assure more staffing with mixed competencies in the embassies, and I think that we, we will see more of that coming uh, in different, so we have a humanitarian and a development uh, person uh, full-time with sort of background in both areas, working in Beirut now with the Syria response, and in a few other places as well. In geography, we have achieved overlap, in term, at least in terms of countries, except for Yemen, I would say. Maybe Yemen will fall on, upon us soon, I don't know. Uh, uh, but apart from that, we are in the same context. Uh, and a few other places uh, of, of these issues that you mentioned as well, I think uh, uh, we have to see as progress. Um, so what are our difficulties? At least one thing is recognizing that we are not a project executor. We are like a fund, funding organization. So we are not designing the projects. And a lot of these issues fall on the project design. So we obviously should pick the guys with the right designs. But it is a little bit different working as a financing entity versus being the one who actually designed the projects and have to more in detail establish the linkages. And the second great difficulty, I think, has to do with context. And that leads me to Syria, that our main obstacles is on the ground in the political realities that we face. Because with all these good intentions we all have, if we are not allowed to work on them, I mean, we are blocked anyway. And, and there I have my... Um, uh, my, uh, my maybe first point of disagreement, and, and that is uh, coming, to, coming to Syria. That is whether Syria is a good case. 
uh, I, I think the, the challenges are, because the, the argument is made, there's so much money, so much attention, so much good intentions uh, expressed by everybody. If it doesn't work in Syria, it shouldn't work. Uh, I'm not so sure Syria is a good case. Uh, if I picked a good case, it's a tip to the evaluators to undress the development community for not doing his good job in terms of bridging the gap, that would be Uganda. Everybody's invited, a plot of land, uh, access to school, uh, no idea that people are going to return next year. Government recognizes this is for the long run, five, six years. We know Sudan is a, is a tricky spot. All opportunities to do good things in the, in the gap. I spent a week there in Uganda, so I'm sure if we sent a bunch of evaluators there, they would pick up a good, few good things that have been done, but also plenty of missed opportunities that we can't blame on anybody else than ourselves. Uh, in Syria, we have a lot of things to blame, actually, on contextual factors that make our life extremely uh, difficult. Um, I asked my Syrian colleagues about the report, and obviously it's a desk study. It's not sort of providing original new findings on and Syria, and they would like to write a few memos uh, on it, <laughs> all, the, all the details on Syria. So, so we shouldn't read these as kind of a Syria report. But there are important things, I think, to, point, to be pointed out that makes Syria a bit unique. One is the Jordan Compact. That was a unique in, kind of innovation for Syria. Um, you know, paying the soft loans to the Jordan government uh, for providing uh, uh, job permits. It was Paul Collier, I think, he claims at least himself, who invented it all. He was traveling to Satari, his own economic free zone on the one side, so why can't you connect? And then he convinced everybody to give soft loans and so on. The Syrians are not working in that economic free zone. Very few of them. Uh, they get jobs in informal sector was all this insistence on work permits as a trigger for loans and so what did we properly address the constraint for labor for 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 for, for creating labor opportunities for Syrians through these kind of loans should i mean the intention nobody questioned the the, the, the good thing in principle to that countries are supported in when they are overwhelmed by refugees everybody support that but do, did we do a good job in identifying the the the, the, the real constraints uh, for the Syrians in Jordan. Uh, some doubts there, and I, I think there's already the literature discussing that. Uh, then the other thing I think that needs to be pointed out is that Syria is a bit ab absurd in one way, you know, because we think of humanitarian actors as the one who bypass government, do things quick, uh, and so on, and long-term development actors, they are the ones who kind of try to work with the government structure and long-term. Syria, it's the opposite. Long-term development actors don't really move in because they don't want to. They don't want to knock on the door of the uh, Minister of Finance uh, of uh, Assad saying, can we help you construct, uh, reconstruct Aleppo so people can move back? No, and maybe for good reasons, but I mean, that's, there are political obstacles there. Uh, the humanitarians, they do. And they work closer with the regime because the humanitarian imperative <laughs> leads them to see that this is the opportunity we have to reach these people. So there has been a gap there, and maybe thanks God there has been a gap there, because we have had the preserved humanitarian space that made these action, although they aren't sufficient and so on, it made them possible. Um, so Syria is, um, in, uh, I mean, every case is peculiar, but Syria is maybe amazingly peculiar in, in some ways. The last point of disagreement, maybe for discussion, do I have time for that? Yeah, very brief. Short very brief. On a few places it said that there's, the call for bridging the gap primarily falls on the humanitarians. Uh, I think there's on two, two places that's written out. Personally, I walk around in my organization saying the opposite. The, 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 the burden of, uh, of, of, of adjusting your perspective and your way of working falls on the long-term development part. The life-saving imperative has to prevail for the humanitarians when underfunding is a reality. And I think somehow I have the Swedish government with me because they have instructed all these long-term development partners, uh, long-term development strategies to adjust their perspectives. 
and slightly less too in, in the instructions on our humanitarian allocation where the humanitarian space is also clearly spelled out as something that we should uh, preserve. So uh, I have a disagreement there. I, 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 um, I preach within my organizations, you are the guys who should primarily adjust your perspective and think slightly differently uh, in relation to the way you used to do. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe CEDA is the exception. Sorry? So maybe CEDA is the exception. <laughs> Uh, and thanks, um, Joran. Again, I feel it's very appropriate. We are in a museum. You bring up uh, Axel Oxenstierna. Uh, yes, in the 1600s, he, held, he already then had identified what we are discussing uh, today. And I think also very pertinent uh, your comments on S uh, S Syria as a case. Uh, the notion of host government is actually the, the, the governments in the neighboring countries. It's, it's not. It's not the government of Syria. And, and some very strong governments too, which we will not have in, in many of the African crises, for example. So it's, it's, there are many unique features of, of this case. So finally, uh, Jörg, um, uh, you lead uh, an evaluation institute, um, and you would like to see what is being produced by people like Alex and Ruben to be uh, taken up and, and used and, and uh, for learning by the aid actors in Germany and, and you would like to see, I think, that this leads to change. So what are, the, what are the barriers, what are the incentives that you see in terms of making this happen? Well, um, thank you. Uh, now it's working? Perfect. Um, I would like to make just three points. Um, the first is um, the constraint or barrier on the one hand or opportunity is, is a question. How, how much time are we willing to invest in learning given the opportunity costs of time? So what I found particularly striking about this report is that there is this, that we have this problem for two three decades, and the finding is that there is a disconnect between conceptual claims, this and that should be done to make, to, to preach, yeah, the, um, 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 to preach both, both fields, but on the other hand, we have little, very little empirical work which really tests what kind of linkage produces best results. So there is a disconnect. And um, given that the topic we are discussing today is a topic where external actors kind of intervene under extreme uncertainty, yeah? they have a huge knowledge gap. And the finding is that over 20 years, there hasn't been much learning, so I think there's something wrong with the knowledge system we're working in. Yeah? And um, so this is not only about Syria, this is not only about Uganda, this is about a structural thing where we find that the knowledge system in aid or humanitarian system is somehow wrong. Because if not, then we would at least have found that well, there are these claims, and now there are kind of researchers and evaluators going on the ground and testing particular claims, coming back and seeing, well, hypothesis wrong, hypothesis right, what we do. But this hasn't <coughs> happened. So I think there must be something systemic. Um, and for me, this is um, um, one issue here is the question, how much time do we really invest into content learning? And how much time do we invest in all of our coordination meetings, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in the discussion on procedures? So, um, the aid industry and the humanitarian assistance industry, from my perspective, when they meet, it's a lot about coordination and procedures, and less about really content. So, this is the first message. The second message is. Quite, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, um, um, I quite go along with, with your um, um, argument about coherence or institutional divisions or silos. So 
I think we, we, we love to talk about policy coherence and everything has to be coherent and, and um, um, yet it's more about a balancing argument. Do we have to move more towards the coherent side or do we have to move more to, towards the specialization side? And I think um, we, we, we do have to analyze particular contexts. As I learn now from Sweden, you have moved, at least during the last years, towards the coherent side. And that's fine. Um, because we know about these institutional divisions between humanitarian assistance on the one hand and structural aid on the other hand, which, which um, inhibit kind of exchange and learning. Now, in Germany, the, 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 the situation is a little bit different because we have two ministries. One is the foreign ministry, which is responsible for humanitarian assistance, and one is the development ministry, which is responsible for um, um, more structural aid. So we have the division at the, highest, <laughs> at the highest level, and that obviously has a lot of implications. Um, so, uh, what to do in such cases? I think that um, if institutional divisions do not permit joint planning and programming, um, then there has to be to at least some pressure to do joint reporting, do joint reviews, or to jo do joint evaluations in order to really identify where are the points to move a little bit more towards coherence? And um, without this, I think um, um, systemic learning will be quite difficult. So the recommendation in such situations where institutional divisions do not allow for joint planning and programming, you have to start with the end, meaning evaluation or um, reviews. Uh, in order to build up incentives to work more closely together. This is kind of the headquarter thing, like institutional divisions, how do we manage this? I think there's an, a third point, uh, and this has to do more with uh, individual accountability. And now I come also to Sweden. There was this very nice book, 2006, uh, The Samaritan's Dilemma. Uh, it's about incentives within uh, or disincentives within aid systems, and it was primarily focused on on on, on the Swedish case. Um, and one which which was also mentioned in our report, I think, is crucial, which is the high turnover rate of uh, local experts. Um, I think this is not only a, a problem of kind of knowledge which is kind of leaving local, the local arena, but it's also a problem of accountability. So when, uh, what, when are local program or project managers are held accountable for what they have reached or not reached? Actually, they are often not held over accountable. So if you are not held accountable, for the things you're doing because you're leaving every two years and no one will trace you trace it back then you do not have an incentive to take up messages from the past learning yeah from an individual i will learn um i, or I will be more um engaged in learning if i know that this learning from the past will provide benefits for myself now if the success uh, I have um, uh, or the failure I have at the local level doesn't make much sense or doesn't have much influence on my career path, given that I'm changing every two years, um, the incentive to learn will not be so big. So I think three points, what time are uh, what amount of time are we really willing to invest in learning under the conditions of interventions under extreme uncertainty? The second issue is what are the measures at the macro level to bring or uh, to bridge institutional divisions? I think here 
joint reviews, joint evaluations are a good instrument. At, at the micro level, I think the big challenge is um, the high um, turnover and accountability related accountability issues related to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jörg. <clears throat> um, very important points, and, and not least what you began by saying. We know too little about what, what is the outcome of, of these gaps. What is it that actually happens on the ground? And what is it that we would like to see in terms of, of, of objectives? About this, we know much too little. I think I, I'll invite you to come back and give some further comments, but we have taken a lot of time now uh, from the podium, so now I'd, I'd like to open the floor for for questions and comments of the panelists or just um, any general reflections that you would like to share. Who would like to? Please, and let us know who you are. There's a microphone coming. Hi, my name is Marlene Hugoson. I work for SKL International. And I have a very basic question that uh, I would have wanted to understand in the beginning of the seminar to uh, have a better understanding of what we're actually discussing. If we are discussing interventions inside Syria only, or if we're talking about the Syria response. Because, of course, when you talk about developmental uh, interventions and humanitarian and how the linkages are between them, you can discuss that into length in Lebanon and Turkey and Jordan, whereas in Syria, it's quite more difficult. Yeah, let's take uh, one or two more questions. So, Hi, my name is Anneli Eriksson and I work at the Karolinska Institute uh, in, um, in the public health division, but on, on uh, and health in disasters, and so my outlook is, is clearly from the humanitarian perspective. And I had three questions or points I wanted to raise. Um, and, and I guess the first one is, is on, on the history and how much we have learned. Because as you say, we have been discussing this gap for, for the last 20, 25 years. But, uh, and, and I know that this study was, was looking at, at uh, I mean, a context that is ongoing today. But what have we learned from from, from the, the lack of, of development in, in Liberia after the first war in the 90s, from the lack of development in South Sudan after the, the peace, uh, peace agreement in 2005 and onwards until, I mean, have we, what are the learnings from, from those uh, examples where, where it perhaps worked and where it didn't work? Because, I mean, how can we otherwise uh, move this forward only by studying what is going on absolutely today? Um, the other one, other point was on needs, because I, I don't hear a lot about needs and, and about context. Yes, that the contexts are very different, but also the needs are very different in, in many ways, right? And so to, to compare the, the gap or to discuss around development needs in Central African Republic, South Sudan and, and Syria at the same time, it's, or, or we could bring in Ukraine for that matter, and, and it's a completely different spectrum. And so I think we also need to... It's a danger in, in grouping everything together and talk about the humanitarian development gap because maybe it's not development that is needed in some of these contexts. And the third is, is on the report that is very interesting. And I was curious about one of the, the recommendations where, where you said that uh, we, we need more um, emphasis on looking at impact and outcome. And to me, those are very different things in a way because outcome is really looking at your program and how well did you, you know, what, what was the outcome of your program? Did you um, meet the objectives? Whereas impact is what we should be looking much more on. Uh, what's the impact of the humanitarian aid on the, in, and what are the long-term consequences for people from that and vice versa on development aid? Thank you, Anneli. One more. Hello, uh, my name is Ulrika Long. I work at SIDA with social protection. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation and for panel comments that give a lot of thoughts for reflection and I look forward to reading the report. Um, looking at this issue, I'm thinking of Lebanon and the efforts there to align the humanitarian actors 
especially in the cash-based uh, humanitarian support. And from a social protection point of view, that is a possibility for actually making a link to the humanitarian support and the cash-based humanitarian support, eventually bridging it. Uh, so I would be very interesting to, interested to hear your comment on the Lebanon case and, and the cash distribution there. Thank you. Thank you. Three good questions. I, I think I'll try to answer the first one. Uh, you asked, are we talking about, uh, uh, what really are we talking about here? Is it the sort of conceptual issue or is it Syria? And of course we are trying to do a bit of both. Uh, but I think man, many have identified that this cannot be, uh, this is not an exhaustive, this is not sufficient. What we have sort of uh, being presented today, we need to go beyond that. And as Anneli pointed out, uh, there's much more to look at in, in, in that respect. Um, I wonder, um, James, could you perhaps address uh, Anneli's the three questions about what have we actually learned from go going sort of further back? How do we look at needs and, and the, the impact outcome issue? And, and then if um, Hulud and, and Yoran could think about the social protection issue because of uh, Hulud's your insights in terms of uh, the predicament of Syrians in Lebanon and, and Yoran, your Syria strategy actually encompasses the neighboring countries. So Lebanon is part of the Swedish uh, Syria strategy. So if you could comment on that. But James first, please. <coughs> uh, what have we learned, or why haven't we learned? <laughs> yes. um, and looking at, you know, f further back, you know, the cases that uh, Anneli we've heard. Yeah, and I think they're good, it's, they're good questions, because it's one thing to look at the, the, the obviously very challenging contexts uh, and to point out all the reasons why it's very difficult to harmonize these agendas. Um, uh, but it's another to say, look, where we've had opportunities, uh, like in the case of Liberia and, and other countries in West Africa, um, to better harmonize and sequence our responses to, on the one hand, a humanitarian crisis, and on the other hand, a, a situation of relative peace that, that needed uh, bolstering, stabilizing, if you like. Um, uh, why haven't we? Been able, why do we see not, seem unable to do that? I mean, some of that goes to the, 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 the normative frameworks for, for, for development. Uh, and those are shifting over time, I think. Uh, I think SEED is actually a very interesting example on this. And I'd, I'd, I'd love to discuss more. But the, the expectations about the, the preconditions for effective development um, are shifting a bit, and they're shifting politically. There's a, there's a greater risk appetite, I would suggest, amongst some donors, not all, <laughs> but some, and Cedar is one of them. And I think that's really important. But that's a, that's a change, because I think uh, donors like Cedar have realized that if you're going to operate in fragile states, there is a certain risk threshold that you can't get away from. You will face risks of uh, program failure, weak governance, lack of accountability, potential corruption. You have to be very alert to them. But if you're going to operate effectively there and prevent, indeed, the potential for situations to fall back into conflict, um, which is one of the dimensions of, of aid that's rather fallen off our agenda, actually, but it, it's, 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 it's still there, um, you have to be prepared to take a certain degree of risk. Now, that um, is difficult for a publicly funded body, uh, accountable to taxpayers. Um, and sometimes that risk, the reason we work with UN agents, through UN agencies is often to transfer the risk through the system. Um, there are very good reasons, or at least there are understandable reasons, why a lot of aid flows through the UN. doesn't mean it's always the right thing to do. I agree. But a lot of it is about risk transfer. Um, so um, I, I, I think some of the hist historic cases are harder to, to, to understand. I, 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 but as I understand, there is a bit of a shift. Uh, in, in donor thinking about this and in working, uh, trying to tackle development issues in what are still very fragile states, possibly emerging from conflict. Um, I, still, I think we've got a long way to go on that. Um, I forget what the other question was, but... but yeah, we have talked very little about needs. What is it that we're trying to address? Yeah, needs. Um, in, 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 indeed. And, and I mean, there's an obvious point to make. 
but I'll make it anyway because I think we have made. If you don't address people's, address people's immediate needs in these situations, any talk about development is completely irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. People have to. People are inevitably preoccupied with today and tomorrow and feeding their families. Of course they are. Some of the strategies they adopt in doing that may be potentially detrimental to their future prospects. Um, and part of our job is to give people more options, safer options, more sustainable options for keeping themselves and their families healthy and fed and so on. Um, so I think we have been a bit short-term in, in our thinking about that. That's changing a bit. Um, in, in some programs that are, you know, donors recognise, you know, we're still doing humanitarian programmes in the same place with the same mechanisms, addressing apparently the same needs for years and years and years. Ah, uh, something isn't right there. Not because we expect the humanitarian work to suddenly transform people's lives. That would be unrealistic. But for the humanitarian work not to have adapted, because, because people adapt to aid. They, they take aid as part of their survival strategies. We don't always adapt with them. And that, that, there's been quite a lot of work on, in DRC on this. So I think our thinking about need over time, as well as between contexts, and I agree about that point, um, has been much too crude. I think there's quite a lot of new thinking about that, but I, and I could talk more about it. But anyway, that's my thought. OK, thanks. Uh, Hulud, would you like to say, yeah, uh, uh, Syrians in Lebanon, particularly the, the, the opportunities for, uh, for social protection interventions as uh, part of aid? Yeah, I will just uh, start by saying actually, like after seven, eight years, I know Syria is complex and very challenging environment, but I'm really surprised that still people talk about the contextual uh, um, challenges um, and how to intervene. It took the whole country to be destroyed, hundreds of thousands, thousands to, be, uh, to be dead, and actually millions to be displaced. And we're still discussing the context, which, which is for me, um, um, yeah, a little bit. Um, and uh, another point I want to mention is also uh, about this linking, and I will come back to, to, to the issue of, of, of the Syrians in Lebanon. Um, it very much depends on, on individuals, and this is, we, we have seen this uh, uh, in the neighboring countries. It very much depends on the country directors, program directors, program managers, to actually um, uh, do something good in Syria and, and, and do really like design uh, programs that meet the needs of the affected pe people. And we, we, we've seen many who would just come, you know, like for, uh, to be expat and just live the lives of expats and not holding any accountability to what they are doing. So this is also something we need to consider because some um, country directors or program managers or whoever, I mean, they would take it very, very seriously and would, they would actually make a change in what they are doing and what they are delivering. Um, in terms of Lebanon, and the social protection. I remember in 2013, and I was doing a field uh, research in Lebanon um, on the protection and coping mechanisms of the Syrian refugees in Lebanon. And to my surprise, and that was still into the summer 2013, which, yeah, five years from now. Um, and to my, to my surprise, it wasn't the accommodation. It, was, it wasn't the employment. It wasn't the, 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 the cash assistance. Uh, all of these elements uh, were very, very important, but it, it came to my surprise that the most important thing for people protection was their dignity. Was their dignity, and this is something I'm uh, working intensively on right now. So it wasn't actually the needs. I mean, this is something uh, people from outside would not think what dignity means to refugees, uh, to the displaced people, how, uh, how they understand actually dignity, whether international humanitarian and development actors are actually maintaining the dignity of, uh, uh, of the refugees and displaced or uh, displaced people or actually uh, undermining uh, their dignity. So also, um, uh, and in that sense, I would say, uh, I think the humanitarian and development uh, sectors have somehow to, uh, to reinvent their, their languages, because for me still it's very, very abstract. Talking about dignity, coordination, resilience, is, is always like all of those concepts uh, for the affected people, very, very abstract, and also for the practitioners are very ab abstract, which for me give this leeway for the international actors to, 
to, to do or not to do uh, what they have or what they should actually be doing in, uh, in crisis. Um, so also, uh, this is something maybe to, uh, to discuss. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And of course, this is very thought-provoking for the aid bureaucrats. How do you translate dignity into something that we know, you know how to do and what to do? What does it mean? In, in, for, for us in, with the instruments that we have. Beyond social protection? Yeah, and on, on cash in Lebanon, uh, just two comments. One, ideally we would like to see, uh, because the humanitarian team is moving over from distributing food and so on to cash-based <coughs> and, and that goes on all over the world, slowly, but moving. Uh, and Lebanon was one of these, uh, these cases. Ideally, we would like to see these systems integrated, uh, building, maybe covering host populations and refugees together and leaving permanent uh, marks on, 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 on improved system overall. Uh, Lebanon doesn't want that. They, they don't want an integrated social protection system for the refugees and the Lebanese population. So it's simply a dead end. I, I've been part of some of these discussions. Uh, it's too long term to do. To, to. So it's an example of where reality is on the ground, despite our good intentions. There's no way forward. The other big debate has been about moving to multi purpose cash. And what does that do to a multilateral system where you have these humanitarian sectors within it, some providing shelter, some providing food, some providing uh, schooling, and so on? Um, so how do you bring all that together when you move into cash? So the UN system in, in Lebanon really made an effort to bring all these parts together. Uh, so what they achieved was kind of parallel financing, where all agencies put their money into the same cash card. So for the beneficiaries, it was a bit like a Swede receiving housing allowance and a child allowance and, and getting it on the same date, uh, on the same card. So, and they were quite proud of that. Uh, but some donors thought it wasn't enough, pushed more for competition within the UN, uh, UN system and uh, framed separate agreements with, uh, with uh, primarily WFP. Um, my personal position, I, th I believe it's the Swedish government's position as well, at least when I have a chance I try to convince them about it, is that we have to give UN a chance to, f to deliver as one. Uh, instigating for competition among UN agencies that we want to operate together should, have, should, have, uh, should not be let to undermine the one UN concept that, that is so strongly supported by, by the Nordics and by, uh, by Sweden. So Lebanon has been a tricky case in terms of uh, multilateral coordination as well. Really tricky one. Uh, and and uh, a few hard feelings left uh, after that process. Uh, and a lot of work also trying to achieve that coordination via unified cash cards, which was fairly good and maybe could have been pushed some additional steps as well if we had had the patience. Thanks. And of course, this is also to emphasize the very different conditions in Turkey, Jordan, and, and, and Lebanon for, for Syrian refugees. Um, would you like to comment, Jod? Perhaps, yeah. On, or should on, we invite uh, yeah. on, on these topics? I think on, on, on the topic on the Leban Lebanon thing, we're Please. currently trying to, to, to set up a, an evaluation um, on the ground in the in the neighboring countries on on, on cash for work um, um, operations and um, I think there are two or three issues. One is um, regarding to the language. I think we have to be able to speak different langu languages to different audiences. It's obvious that in such a seminar we are more on the conceptual level, but on the you know, on our evaluation work on the ground, we work with local experts which are able to transfer the word dignity into a culturally adopted context when we construct our service. Obviously. So this, is, this has to be done. The other thing is output, outcome and impact. I think what we are, must move forward is to, to not only look at the Im immediate objectives, but at the outcome level, so at the individual level, what, what changed uh, at the individual level. And this is possible due with experimental, quasi-experimental designs, large surveys, and so on. The real difficult thing is impact in the long term, because you don't find people anymore. So 
if someone today um, 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 participates in different kind of cash for work programs, what is the effect on his individual life five years after compared to someone who didn't participate? That's the crucial question about impact. And the difficulty is how do you find someone in five years from now and ask him the questions and then compare him to, to someone who has not uh, um, 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 received this, this kind of cash for Cash, cash program. Yeah, let's first see if the, we have more. I was tempted people. to market the study. That we made. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you, you, you can do it later. I'll give you we, a we had, uh, two minutes we, towards the end. <laughs> well, to the end, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, further questions, please? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Annette Wilhelmsen and I come from NORAD's evaluation department and uh, I liked your point about learning and also the point about conducting more joint evaluations to, in order to move towards coherence because that's especially important on the ground. So my question is for Deval and Jörg, I guess, and also for EABBA if you have good experiences in conducting these joint evaluations on the ground because I know that we are definitely not uh, delivering on that point from my department. So. Thank you. Um, uh, one more? Please, Peter. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Peter Merik from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the MENA unit. Um, I had a question to James Darcy of, out of just interest. It's mentioned in, in early in the presentation that UNICEF works both on, uh, on uh, long-term development and humanitarian. And since, uh, James, you worked a little bit on, on UNICEF, I'm wondering if what your insight or what your experience of UNICEF working as a, both an, an, a, a, an agency in, in both sectors, so to say, and as a policy setting agency, uh, it works on as a donor sometimes and an implementer. If anyone should be able to link, make the link, it's, it's a, an agency like UNICEF. What's your experience of their, their work? Thank you. So let's first address the experience of joint evaluations. I can't speak for EBA because I've only been a member for about a year or so. But I think you probably know more about us than I do. Well, DEVAL is a young institute, so unfortunately um, we missed the times when joint evaluations were more in vogue. So during the heydays of the Paris Agenda, the last decade, there were incentives to do joint evaluations, particularly among the, the Nordics, yeah? um, but also um, in Germany. And then in, in that time, I, I, had, I had experiences with large joint evaluations on budget support, like with four or five donors doing one evaluation together, highly transaction cost intensive, but at the end of the day, I think it was worth the effort because there was a lot of joint learning and it gives an evaluation more weight. Um, currently, unfortunately, I do perceive a re-bilateralization of uh, foreign aid in Europe during the last 10 years or so, which then also um, um, it has increased the barriers for joint evaluations. But I mean, I, th I would very much welcome initiatives who, who, who go into this direction again. And, and I think I can speak for EBA actually that we would also welcome this. Uh, uh, there are some issues we have discussed, I think, where this might be appropriate. But uh, so let's talk more about this, uh, James. Internal gaps in UNICEF do they yeah, exist? I, I, indeed, I'll say a word on that. Just, just one comment, if I may, on yeah. the um, the question about evaluations and evidence. I mean, I, I, I lead a lot of evaluations, uh, particularly for UN agencies, where they say, "Well, we'd really like you to tell us something about the impact that we've had." And I say, "Great, you show me the data that you've collected as you've been man managing your mounting your programs, and we'll analyze it." For it. There isn't any. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a question about learning, certainly, but there's even a prior question about, if you like, the diagnostic component mm -hmm. of humanitarian and development practice. It's really weak. Uh, and you compare this, I mean, it's not a fair comparison, compare the medical sector, who spend about a third of their budget on diagnostics, 
figuring out <laughs> what's wrong with people and whether the treatment works. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm generalising. We spend a tiny fraction. So if the data isn't there, you can't evaluate it. Um, we can't do much primary work. On, on UNICEF, it's a good question. I, um, UNICEF tends to shift and be reasonably good at shifting from sort of upstream policy, government-facing work, to downstream, more practical, uh, operational field work, uh, and to be able to, to, to link the two. Sometimes it gets it right, sometimes not. But it's pre-existing links with government with ministries, particularly the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, have, in a lot of the cases I've looked at, been a real bonus and almost the only bit of the UN that, is, that has that level of engagement and that, therefore that level of uh, networks and contacts. It's been true in Yemen. I've just been looking at the cholera response. It was a huge moment. I mean, and government in Yemen is completely fractured, split, dysfunctional and everything. But they have a network of volunteers which UNICEF was able then to mobilise. So that... Linked to government, established in, in, in more stable times, generally, be becomes really critical when, when it comes to humanitarian response. Also, conceptually, I mean, UNICEF have a child survival agenda within a wider child development agenda, and their specialists work on both. I mean, occasionally they're split, as in Turkey, which was a mistake, but normally the, 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 the specialists work on both the development and the humanitarian agenda. So... Actually, conceptually, they're quite well joined up. So, <clears throat> I mean, they're, they face lots of difficulties and lots of problems, and they're entirely reliant on partner capacity. But one of their partners is government, and on often that is neglected in some of these conflict situations. Governments don't disappear. Ministries don't suddenly have no capacity. Um, and their ability to work at a sometimes quite low level with ministries in a way that doesn't politically contaminate them is part of what UNICEF's added value is, I think. Thank you. Um, we have another 15 minutes now. I thought I'd give you each one uh, one minute to uh, market the study or make any other final comments that you would like to make. And then I'll invite Alex to uh, to give us his comments, uh, Alex and or Ruben, uh, the, your comments uh, on what you've heard, what's been debated, and then we'll try to uh, make a very brief summary. So... Uh, beginning with Jöran, then. Okay, One yeah. minute. I assume we have a few evaluators in the room, so uh, I should take the opportunity to market one evaluation that we have been financing uh, via UNICEF, precisely in Lebanon, and the re evaluation question was, does cash lead to more schooling for children? Is it, does it work as an instrument? So, uh, obviously, people wanted to set up a randomized controlled trial. Lebanese government said, no way, we don't do that kind of thing. Uh, but we don't have money to do it all over Lebanon, so we have to start in certain governance. Okay, that's fine. And then what was done was a regression discontinuity model where you compared the people living on a government that received cash with the people living across the border in the government where they did not receive cash. And you were able to also check for the spillover effect of people moving across the border. And so. Uh, so that paper is out, soon to be published. And uh, good news, we should... And on a happy note, uh, children do stay more yeah. in school. Uh, <coughs> significant impact on drop, dropout uh, rates uh, cool. from that study. Uh, so that is, uh, I happen to be, my, it's my former workplace, Innocenti. Uh, so they are setting up a program now with um, uh, rigorous uh, impact interventions in humanitarian settings. And on, they had a conference just uh, one or two weeks ago. There are seven working papers on different issues around the world where these kind of methodologies has been used to actually try to capture the impact of, of cash interventions in, in, um, in humanitarian interventions. Thank you, Jörg. Jörg? Okay. Uh, one, one, one final issue, and I think to strengthen one point which has been made is um, we do have to integrate, or there is a tension, we do have to integrate local expertise. I mean, uh, we do have to integrate local expertise. Without integrating local expertise, uh, we have a real big issue. 
The tension, however, is that particularly in situations of protracted crisis, um, <clears throat> local expertise often is not neutral. Yeah, um, for obvious reasons, yeah, the uh, local expertise can be easily part of the con con conflict. Yeah, or, so I think there is a certain, um, certain dilemma. There's, on the one hand, there is a call for integrating local expertise, which is absolutely true. But on the other hand, um, um, it is quite normal and understandable that there is a high probability that local expertise will have a certain position, normative position, on the conflict situation. And this is, poses then challenges on how we deal with these uh, uh, local expertise. And I, I think this is something uh, we are all struggling with on the ground, maybe. Yeah, can I introduce you as a local expert, Khulud? <laughs> Your comments, please. Um, thank you very much, because actually that was in my final comments, and uh, because I mentioned something about how local expertise, uh, even if we're international, we're, st we're still seen as local. Uh, um, and I was uh, just saying that we're always asked to be neutral and to uh, uh, to be part. Uh, to be neutral and, and to be impartial. Um, and I mentioned that, <clears throat> of course, for many reasons, as, as I would agree, it's very difficult. Uh, we all have stances, we all have our, you know, like opinions, but who doesn't? Like if the whole international, again, like if the whole international uh, community is involved in Syria and the whole foreign aid, whether humanitarian or development, are politicized in Syria, why Syrians are not allowed to be somehow to take a stance in their own country. This is the argument that I actually uh, 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 don't uh, often understand. It's, it's, it's not about being neutral or partial. It's just to recognize when you do the work where you stand and how to actually analyze and, and, and substantiate your arguments without, uh, 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 without you know, like, being extreme to one side. So as long as we know where we stand, I don't think there is any risk in, in having the local expertise. And, and if we go to the cross-border operations, the UN agencies in Damascus, that, I mean, it's a scandalous how they deal and cooperate with the Syrian regime and they actually undermine the whole humanitarian principles functioning inside Damascus, uh, working with the regime, contracting billions uh, to this, to the regime cronies, and and still, as Syrians, we're asked to be neutral and partial, so uh, and impartial. Sorry, um, <clears throat> and again, um, we can see this uh, more in the cross-border operations. And why I say that the uh, working with the local expertise, because I think if the international organizations and donor countries have listened to us from the beginning. And I have many examples from Syrian organizations operating in Syria and about education, for example. And they were trying to convince the donors from early as 2013, 2014, that those activities you're giving to the Syrian children in camps, <coughs> sorry, uh, just to jump up and down, they are important, but they were trying to convince to provide children with informal and formal education, but they didn't listen. And so even when in Lebanon, again, um, uh, uh, the shift or they moved from humanitarian to resilience and development, that affected basically the Syrian children and the Syrian population because this shift is never smooth. But it wasn't actually done properly <coughs> in, in Lebanon. Uh, just one final uh, point uh, about the five-year strategy plan in Sweden and in any other donor country. Um, I know that there are guidelines and I know that they are like very important for the donor countries to have those strategy, long-term strategy plans. But, but for me as, as, as a researcher, as, as a Syrian, as local expert, as, um, I just, if we want to have those plans effectively and if we want again to give the ownership and the agency to the Syrian people, I want to ask how much Syrians have been involved to contextualize these plans, how much they have been involved in designing and the planning 
uh, of these plans? How much will be actually going to the Syrians at the end? Who is gonna, uh, because it's like, again, a huge amount of money and a hu huge amount of fund, thanks to Sweden and to all the other uh, uh, donor governments, but who's gonna evaluate, who's gonna see this information, and this is like I mentioned about sharing information and lack of information, this kind of information should be ready at any donor government, at any organization, at any UN agency. How much is received by at the end, toward the end, and how much is effective uh, this money um, has been spent, and how much also like you are involving the Syrians, whether they are in Germany, Sweden, France, or like Norway, uh, in, in, in any other country. And again, back to, to give the ownership uh, and agency, and also to have this nexus effectively, because we are part of the conflict, as, as many said, but we also, we are the solution. The solution would not be without us. Thank mm. you. Thank you very much, Hulu. Uh, James? No, no further. No further? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so, who, who are you both coming up, or who would like to? Okay, please. <clears throat> um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much um, for the uh, the panel discussion. It was very enlightening for us. And uh, there's just a couple of things that we we take definitely away with us today is that it will be maybe very interesting to broaden the conceptual base of our analytical framework. We have heard about uh, the protection as a very uh, valid contribution to that. So this is definitely something that we will take away. And uh, it was also interesting to hear from you that um, the ownership aspect of it, like how strong does it come into uh, play here? And uh, in our case, we have focused on international humanitarian assistance and international development cooperation. It would be also interesting to see whether local humanitarian assistance and local development initiatives have the same struggles of linking each other. So this is just a very interesting thought. Yeah, I would also like uh, thank you to the uh, discussion to James, Jörg, Göran and Kholut. Many thanks for it. So we will take it home and uh, reflect on it. I just pick one or two points uh, which I'm thinking about. Um, for example, well, I mean, we have uh, heard words like uh, we need, um, uh, what about the needs of the people? What is coming, uh, uh, reaching the Syrian peoples? And I would absolutely agree to it. This um, um, linking discourse is still an aid <coughs> industry related discourse. It's not really that much people centered as it should be. And that's exactly why we are uh, uh, trying to uh, bring in more um, outcome related uh, uh, research. So if we relink what is reaching the people, this is really uh, important. And there are many other points I could, uh, but I will reflect on it and <laughs> bring it back. Oh. But um, if I'm already standing here, I would like to thank uh, to our partner, Eba, uh, uh, for the very fruitful and excellent uh, cooperation. I would like to uh, thank to, uh, Jan, Johan, Pea, and all the others uh, from Eba who made this uh, excellent uh, conference possible in our joint evaluation. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you to the panelists. Uh, we, we, uh, maybe you shouldn't have applauded until I've tried to make my s summary. Um, but still, um, and of course one cannot really summarize uh, uh, a seminar like this, but a couple of points. This is obvious, this is a very difficult topic that we have been discussing today. And I think maybe some of you feel that we have been a bit all over the place and it's, it's difficult to sort of disentangle this. Um, uh, what is it that we are ultimately trying to achieve? And obviously, we know too little when we identify all these gaps, these nexus gaps. We don't quite know what does it mean on the ground for people. What is it that should happen that is not happening? And, and clearly, we need to know much more about that. Um, um, and we are talking about the system issue. This is not something that individual organizations who are part of this tremendous, this immense humanitarian and, uh, aid and development aid effort in, in Syria. This is not something that individual agencies can, can resolve. They can do some things internally, 
but it's only when the system functions as you know a little bit like a system where the different parts actually interact in a deliberate way that there will be change and obviously this is very difficult uh, for this so-called system to to achieve one way of of um, making it happen is to see a normative change i mean if you cannot achieve it through improved coordination and so on if if norms are being disseminated being adopted being being uh, uh, become sort of uh, what steers the principles that steers the the actions of all these different agencies i think that's an area we have to look at and, and, and think about what kind of normative change is needed for this system to provide the kinds of outcomes uh, that we are looking for. But we know too little about outcomes. Also, um, obviously, it's a bit uh, strange to approach and talk about Syria through the lens of uh, humanitarian development nexus. And I think as uh, Hulud particularly has reminded us, we need to talk uh, about Syria in its own right, uh, you know, from a Syrian perspective, and address all the all the very difficult problems that we have only touched upon here, and that you have um, written about and, and, and sort of shown us. But so, if there's any thing that we need to take back as EBA, I think is 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 this one: what are our reflections about Syria and and the way that aid functions or does not function in in Syria? Um, so please, uh, you are now excused. I'll say a few words about what happens next. But I want to remind everybody that there's actually an exhibition called Syrian Stories, Bretels of von Syria, in this museum. So if anyone would like to see um, uh, messages in terms of objects and stories from Syrian refugees in Sweden, you can go downstairs and have a look at that uh, exhibition. Uh, then this is the final EBA seminar for this season. We all take a summer break soon. But there are some interesting things, not yet dates set, uh, that will happen in the autumn. The, the two seminars I'd like to mention. One is on uh, Swedish aid in the era of shrinking democratic space. Uh, with Turkey as the, as the case, if you like, if we can talk about Turkey as a case. Um, so this will happen, and there will also be a review of the effectiveness of general budget support, support, which I think is quite interesting. We almost never talk about budget support uh, today. Why is that, and what do we know about it, and what the experiences are there? How is there a new way of looking at, uh, at general budget support? So those two seminars will, will happen in the autumn, and a number of other very interesting things. So I, I encourage you to have keep uh, watching the EBA website and you will see announcements for, for new exciting events. Thank you all for coming. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>